to me? Yeah, yeah, okay. All right. Okay, Lakshmi Prasad, everybody is joined in. Great. Hi. All right. Hi. Hi, hi. Hello. Hello. Hi, guys. Hi. Yeah, so my screen is on? Yes. Yes, yeah. yes. Great. Yes. Okay, so let's start off. Uh, I'm going to be talking today about haiku, but not just haiku. I'm going to give you a very brief snapshot of both uh, a little bit about uh, painting, which often goes along with haiku. It's called ukiyo-e painting, often called floating world painting, and is situated around the entertainment district of Japan, especially of uh, Tokyo. Uh, and there's a very good book called Artist of the Floating World, but perhaps a better term than floating world would be fleeting world, uh, because this talks about the transience of life and tries to capture life as it is. Um, Japan is a very strange country. We had a little discussion about this when uh, my classmate Shri Kumar and I, my friend Shri Kumar was presenting his thing on the you know, Indian Air Force and the world wars. And, you know, somebody brought this up, how they are a highly cultured race, country, but also they are responsible for some of the greatest atrocities. So some of these lovely concepts like Ikigai, uh, Ua Baitori, which is, you know, take life as it comes, uh, accept that you are different and don't feel bad about it. Kintsugi, which is accepting that things can break, but you repair them keeping the repair obvious. So that's out of golden repair. Furoshiki, which is, uh, you know, uh, packaging, which is, uh, which really takes in reusing and recycling to a maximum level. And finally, this wabi-sabi, the beauty and appreciation of things that are imperfect, impermanent. You accept the flow of life and that it is, you know, just transient. So some beautiful concepts. And of course, business to, uh, you have uh, Kaizen and so on. So they come up with some of the greatest concepts. At the same time, they are responsible for some of the nastiest things that have happened to humanity. The rape of Nanking, which Sri Kumar Naya referred to, some of the worst atrocities, worse than anything the Germans did, perhaps, not as well known. Seppuku, and this is the famous author Yukio Mashimo, was a very strange guy who tried to, uh, who had a very fascist ideology, tried to take over the country, and when he failed, committed seppuku or harakiri. And of course, they had a worse caste system than we did. Uh, and they have a very, very hierarchical, syst hierarchical system that persists even today. And you see the hierarchy, the pyramid, uh, which is very large at the bottom with a lot of outcasts. They call them eta or burakumin. And they are treated even worse than, you know, the lower caste were in India. So uh, they have both extremes of their culture. So moving on to haiku, a haiku is a short 17 syllable poem. It typically evokes nature, it evokes a mood and most haiku poems, and this is considered in English to be the way a haiku should be written. It should follow a five, seven, five structure. And what is this five, seven, five? It's five syllables in the first line, seven syllables in the second line and five syllables in the third line. And this is perhaps not true of what the Japanese haiku is because their language structure is very different, but this is what, how it has been translated into English. Now the haiku has certain characteristic features. Uh, nature is the original purpose of the haiku. So originally haiku were all written around nature. Then you have a word or a phrase that places it in a particular season, again, carrying on the nature theme. So if you use the word sakura, it meant, as you know, ch cherry blossom and symbolized spring. You had Fuji, uh, which is for summer, and it's the wisteria plant or wisteria tree. And you had Tusk or the moon for autumn, and the autumn moon is a very well-known icon in Japanese literature, and uh, especially in August. And you had Samushi, which means cold for winter. So you put in one of these words to place it in that particular season, <coughs> that is the Kigo. Then you have a word which is a cutting word, it typically occurs between the second and the last line or the second and the third line. It's called a kereji and it really changes, breaks up the rhythm of the uh, poem. 
and kind of emphasizes that third line, which often throws the rest of it into meaning. So you have the nature underlying the whole thing, a kigo, which places it in a particular season, the kireji, which is the cutting word, which breaks up the rhythm of the three uh, lines. And finally, you have to put the whole thing together with a five, seven, five structure. And for me, why I like the haiku is it's short, you can write it quickly, but it's very important that to make this structure, you have to put a certain amount of rigor in it. So it's not only, you know, it is a, it of course has a certain element of uh, poetry within it. It has nature within it, but it also demands a certain rigor in your writing. And that's why I like it. I, I like this combination of spontaneity as well as the rigor that you have to bring into it because it cannot break this 575 structure. So these are the, this is the basic haiku formula. And if you plan to write haiku, please fo follow this formula. That's what we've all agreed on in English. The haiku has a long history. There was something called the hokku, which pro preceded the haiku. And it was actually the introduction to a longer poem. The longer poem was called a rengu. And the hokku initially had this 575 structure and was used to place the longer poem in a season and in a mood. And one of the acknowledged masters of the haiku, uh, he wrote an earlier version, which was a shorter version called the Haikai. He was a person called Matsuo Basho. And I'll start off with some of the haiku written by some of the acknowledged masters of the haiku from Japan. Now you have haiku, which is spread into all languages, including English. And probably the first person was Ezra Pound, uh, a contemporary and a good friend of T.S. Eliot, uh, who had his unfortunate side also like the Japanese. He was terribly anti-Semitic. Uh, he was accused of collaborating with the Nazis and uh, I think went to prison after the war for his uh, collaboration with them. And as I said, for me, the strict requirement of the 575 structure is an attraction uh, and it enforces a certain discipline but these days it's not confined to nature. It can spread into other fields and that's what I uh, tend to do. So let's look at a few haiku. Uh, this person called Catherine Luck, I think heads the Haiku Association in Japan. And I've taken her example to show you how a haiku transforms from an image or a mood into this well-defined uh, 575 structure. And Catherine Luck starts with this image of uh, this tree and she said, basically, you describe the essence of the moment. She starts off by saying, spring has finally come to town after a winter that seemed it would never end. And everyone must know that it has come to town. So she starts with this idea, basically. And then she narrows it down to two juxtaposed images. One is a concrete parking strip where nothing blooms. And there you have a single tree and this single tree she feels is shouting its defiance in the language of pink flowers. So these are the two images, the concrete barren parking strip and the pink flowers, which is saying there is more than this barren strip. So she connects the two images with a cutting word and here she uses just a dash, the pink line refers to the dash. And she starts off by saying on a concrete parking strip, nothing blooms. Juxtapose it, contrapose it with another sentence that says, a single tree shouts its defiance in the language of pink flowers. But this obviously is nothing to do with haiku. It doesn't follow the structure of the haiku. So what does she do? She puts in a seasonal word, which is one of the important features. Uh, on a concrete parking strip, nothing grows in the drizzle. And a single tree shouts its defiance in the language of pink flowers still not the structure of the haiku, though it has the seasonal word and it has the kiregi, the cutting word. So she now cuts it down to 17 syllables in a 575 structure. So you don't need the full sentence. She says, concrete parking strip. In the drizzle, silence reigns. Dash, a tree roars in pink. Oh. So you have the drizzle, you have the silence, and you have the roar of the tree uh, in pink. So the silence is broken by the pink and it's a defiant roar. And all this is juxtaposed against the barren concrete parking strip. So that's the final uh, image with the photograph. Concrete parking strip in the drizzle, silence reigns, a tree roars in pink. 
So I thought this was particularly beautiful and a nice way of taking you from the initial photographic image to the concept of winter, the barrenness of the parking strip. And here is a tree which is telling you that, you know, you will survive winter. So it's roaring its defiance and the pink flowers contrast against the drizzle, the winter season and the cold barren strip. The old haiku uh, also have, you know, very, very simple concepts, but as you think about it, they grow on you. So as I said earlier, Basho was the acknowledged master of haiku. And very often uh, haiku are juxtaposed against uh, these ukiyo-e paintings. And I thought I'd put the two together. Those these are not the original pictures that go with, along with it. Very often the painting would have the haiku written on it. So Basho's painting, uh, Basho's haiku, which is one of the well-known haiku, a lot of people start off with this, starts off an old pond, a frog jumps in, the sound of water. So three lines, uh, when it's translated, people don't strictly follow the 575, but this is a haiku in the original format. So an old pond, a frog jumps in, the sound of water, again, very strictly sticking to nature. One of the other uh, masters is uh, Yosa Busan, and we go from century to century. The light of a candle is transferred to another candle, spring twilight. Uh, yet another master, a little later, Kobayashi Issa, he says the world of dew and within every dew drop, a world of struggle. To really appreciate haiku, you need to spend some time thinking about the image and the uh, words because there are, like a lot of Zen thought, there's a lot more in the apparent simplicity of the uh, image, in the in simplicity of the poem. Hokusai was one of the great painters, and this is a painting he wrote, but he was also probably one of the famous uh, haiku writers. He writes, I write, erase, rewrite, erase again, and then a poppy blooms. And this is his painting of poppies, not really meant to accompany this haiku. I write, erase, rewrite, erase again, and then a poppy blooms. Hokusai is very famous for his paintings and we all know this painting. It's an iconic painting, uh, often used in advertisements. It's called Great Wave of Kanagawa Coast and it just appears everywhere. It's one of those most loved paintings. It's often used to illustrate tsunamis because this was a tsunami that has been talking about. And of course that uh, indelible image of Japan, Fuji, Fujiyama or Fujisan in the background. Uh, Hokusai also uh, wrote, uh, I mean, painted other paintings. He had 36 views of Fuji in different aspects and different seasons. And this is a person called Hodogaya on the Tokaido Road. Now, the Tokaido Road is another very iconic road. Uh, it's almost like uh, the, you know, the roads that the Romans built or Highway 56, Highway 65 in the United States. Uh, so the, the, the Tokaido Road connected uh, Edo or modern day Tokyo with their old capital Kyoto and Edo or uh, Tokyo was actually started by uh, the shoguns as you know a counterpoint to the traditional capital Kyoto. So they wanted their own capital while they still paid great homage to the uh, emperors they were actually in control. So they really had their own capital. And so there was a lot of movement on this road, the Tokaido, uh, and therefore it has become a classic in uh, Japan, in Japanese art and Japanese poetry in their stories. And the Tokaido road is also uh, immortalized in a series of paintings by Hiroshige, one of the great woodblock painters. Uh, it's called the 53 Stations of the Tokaido. And it starts in Kyoto and goes, goes all the way up to Edo. Uh, and he's got paintings at each one of these stations, which are way stations people stop and rest and then move on. I just put in a few of these stations. And this is leaving Nihonbashi, which is the beginning of the Takaido Road. And you know these woodblock paintings really, to me, encapsulate Japanese art. And I just love this art. Uh, so Nihonbashi, uh, you can see people leaving, the whole crowd of people crossing the typical Japanese arched bridge. And you have people from all walks of society, 
the rich people being carried in uh, palanquins. You can see that at the back. You have the person with the umbrella and you have sellers, fish sellers and other uh, merchants uh, who are walking down the road. So uh, chock full of images of traditional Japan. And then you go down to the second station, you're already in rural Japan and go down further, there is the 12th station and there you have a mask which is often used in their uh, uh, plays. And you're seeing a person who's carrying a mask from one place to the other. And as you can see, he's uh, you know, accompanied by his family and he's walking down the Tokaido road because that is one of the main business avenues of the country. Going, going down to the 17th station, you have a person being carried by weary porters. The 19th station where women are being ferried across uh, by a whole lot of people. And again, you can see people crossing in both directions. And finally, the end of the Tokedo Road, people are finally reaching the city. There's a lot of commonality between the paintings and the haiku that we're going to read. But importantly, Suji has spoke about Van Gogh and the spirit of alienation. And it's often not known that Van Gogh was very heavily inspired by Japanese art. Initially, he followed traditional classic uh, European art, but then there was an exhibition of Japanese art. And this happened at the end of the 19th century when Japan was suddenly opened up after the Meiji restoration. The shoguns lost their power, the emperor took over again, and Japan was open to the world with gunboat diplomacy by Admiral Perry. But along with that, people came to know about the immense riches of Japanese art and Japanese culture and Japanese literature. And there was a big painting exhibition, a exhibition of uh, Japanese art, as it was called, and other things from Japan, including their clothes, their costumes, and so on. And this was in Paris when Van Gogh was there. And Van Gogh was hugely inspired by this. And you can see, this is one of his paintings called Almond Blossoms, and very heavily inspired by Japanese art. And you know, Van Gogh is one of my favorites, practically my favorite painter, as he is, I'm sure, many of you. So the debt that we owe to Japanese painting stands out here. I'll go on to a few of my own haiku. Uh, this was inspired by seeing parrots eating a mango on the tree opposite my house, my neighbor's mango tree. Rose ringed parakeet, poly mango, blushing pink, made for each other. Uh, accompanied by paintings from Japan, ukiyo-e paintings from Japan. And I decided to call this spring romance because this was happening in spring. Dawn, uh, Ishan knows this one because he wrote something fairly similar and I'd written something earlier, so I sent this to him. Uh, Dewdrop on a leaf, first rays of the rising sun, the world holds its breath. Uh, inspired again by the fact that, you know, everything is very quiet uh, it's like the world is not breathing and the first uh, rays of the sun were uh, refracting through this dew drop or actually a few dew drops on a leaf, but there was this big drop that was hanging and you could see the sun's uh, rays coming through that. And this was uh, an unknown painter uh, uh, talking about sunrise on a beach in Japan. I was remembering one of the lovely times we spent in on Ohm Beach. This was again not uh, at night, this was during the day, but with a little bit of poetic license, I changed it to night, uh, called it Om is where the heart is, uh, full moon overhead. I walked on Om Beach's sands, always in my heart, something I've never really forgotten. Uh, and again, another moonrise over a beach in Japan. So full moon overhead, I walked on Om Beach's sands, always in my heart. A uh, lot of pigeons in our area, and you often find uh, eagles, actually kites, attacking uh, pigeons and, uh, you know, uh, cats attacking pigeons. So this was called Talon Hunt, uh, pun on talent hunt. Pigeons fly above, a lone feather spirals down, hungry kites breakfast. Uh, still on the theme of nature, and by the way, this is the same Hiroshige who's painted the uh, uh, 56 stations on the Takaido Road, or 52 stations on the Takaido Road. A lot of uh, problems with politics, people taking sides, and no side really is right. 
So, and the earth goes on. And we saw that whatever happens, nature triumphs, nature survives, which inspired me to write this Proud Boys Antifa, QAnon, left, right, left, right, and time marches on. Uh, the capitals for left and right, and later making it small, uh, were deliberate to move from uh, the politics and the extremes. And then you go to the left and the right politically, and then you march left, right, time marches on. So this is called As the Earth Turns. Uh, I was initially wondering where to call it, uh, a term that Rajiv Gandhi used when he said, uh, dogs bark, the caravan moves on. But I thought that was very insulting to everybody involved. So I decided to change it and make it as the earth turns. And really that's what I was trying to convey that no matter what humanity does, we are a very tiny fragment of what life on earth is, the many millions of years that earth lives and will live on when we are gone. So that's what this title as the earth turns was supposed to convey. One of the other concepts that I really love is the uh, Jain concept of Mitchami uh, Dukkadam, which is, forgive me if I have hurt you in any way during the past year. Uh, and really many of the Jain concepts are really lovely. And I was actually taking my morning walk when this Jain nun walked by masked. And this was in COVID time. So I was very struck by how the Jains have used their masks from well in the past. But this is not to protect themselves, but to protect insects and other tiny creatures. So this is the other version of why a mask is used to protect yourself and to protect others, which really is the function of a mask. You use a mask to protect others, not really yourself. So this haiku was entitled Michami Dukkadam. Jain nun hobbles by, masked well before COVID times, Tirthankara's rock. And here, of course, you have an itinerant Buddhist nun, but it's actually a, an actor, a male actor, uh, because females didn't act in Japan and China. It was always males who took the role, like large parts of India. And this is a famous actor then, Sanjo Kantaro. I've always been struck by women, uh, you know, who are often given no choice when they get married. Uh, so I call this wedding web. Nadaswaram's Blair, she takes the Saptapadi, silence trapped in silk. And uh, the painting, of course, is of a man dreaming of a woman in a spider's web. And I thought this was so appropriate to uh, some forms of marriage. A lot of us are lucky. We haven't needed to go through that. But I've always wondered how, you know, a woman has to take this silently. And sometimes the man also. Let's not be only about women. But uh, Nadaswaram's blare, the noise, while she is silently trapped in her silken sari, taking the Saptapadi, hence this wedding web. So that was my last uh, hope to continue writing these poems. Uh, thank you all for listening, and I'll hand it back to Shibu, and the drinks are on. Fantastic. Very good. That's the only one. Beautiful. Fantastic. Really Beautiful. nice. Lovely, lovely. Very good. Very nice. Thank you so much for sharing those. Thank you. Because it's very difficult. Are, uh, actually, to, actually, yeah. You need more time. Like you said, it takes time to for the words to sink in and absorb. Yeah. So we'll have to go through this recording again several times to yeah. <laughs> really get a grasp of it. Absolutely. But lovely. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, Dr. Dr. Murli Mohan. Yes, sir. You know, you seem to have done a deep research into Japanese and uh, I wanted to ask you if you ever come across this thought. The Japanese are a race of contradictory uh, behavior. Uh, they are extremely deep in certain things. They have done so much solid work in manufacturing like Kaizen that you mentioned. There are many other things one can talk about in Japanese thing. They are very artistic. They are very soft, they are very polite, but at the same time, they have this uh, streak in them, which make them, uh, you know, so nasty at some times. So I often wonder, there is no other race in the world which is demonstrates such uh, contradictory and contrary characteristics. Why is it like that? Do you know? 
I don't know, sir. I think it's, I, you know, I think the Germans have a very similar tendency. The Germans can be very hard. They can also be very artistic, very literate, lit, lit, literary, uh, extremely inventive. And I think there's a lot of similarity between those two cultures. Uh, don't know why. Uh, it's no accident, therefore, that they were on the, you know, formed an axis, really. Uh, I think the Japanese have always felt, uh, and this is one of the theories advanced, I think, that they have felt inferior to the Chinese uh, because they got a lot of their culture from China. They got a lot of their culture from Korea, and they are always disputing this, that their culture came from China and Korea. And the Koreans are also very upset about this because they know that, you know, they have transmitted the culture from China through themselves to Japan, but the Japanese refused to acknowledge it. And that's why the Japanese attacked, enslaved the Koreans for a long, long time, and also the Chinese. So I think it's something to do with this, you know, inferiority, feeling of inferiority, and the need to establish their superiority. They do not respect people who are defeated. They have great contempt for people they have defeated. And uh, they take defeat very, very hard, you know, they, which is why they commit seppuku. You cannot take defeat. I mean, it's ingrained in their culture and has not changed today. So if you allow yourselves to be put down, then you deserve to be where you are is kind of their thought. Uh, I know in every, practically every field of art, literature, it is far more challenging to be brief rather than elaborate. I did advertising and it was far tougher to make a 30 second film than a full feature film. And Haiko to me, all that I've heard today exemplifies that. And unlike somebody who said brevity is the soul of wit, I think he should have said brevity is the soul of soul. There is so much soul in, in all this. And to amazing aspect of it is that it is done in such brief expression, uh, phenomenal. Yes, absolutely. But I love that term you used. Clearly, uh, you know, a professional life spent, spent in the ad world gives you the <laughs> ability to coin these phrases on, this, on the spot. <laughs> Brilliant. Yeah. Sir, absolutely loved it, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ishan. Yeah. Um, I just want, just had a question out of these various concepts when it comes to the different ways of life and uh, be it Ikigai or Wabi Sabi, would there be one concept that stands out and resonates the most with you, sir? <laughs> I suppose it's Ikigai because that's really the intersection of all these very important areas. Uh, but I know, you know, you can't really separate one from the other. I think they all go together. So if we want to write uh, haiku, you, would you say first thing is to get the idea? That's what you're saying, right? Absolutely. Like what is it that you want to convey? Absolutely. And then you uh, sort of evolve Absolutely. as you modify. The yeah, Kate example yeah. is the best example. The, the first Pardon? one you walked us through. The first example. Yeah, the first one. Yeah, the one he showed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a good state. Yes, getting yes, happy. yes. Yeah, Catherine. Catherine. Lacks. Catherine. Yeah. 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 I thought that was brilliant, actually, the way she, you know, broke it down and brought in the 575 structure. And actually, if you look at it, every stage enhanced it. You know, an ordinary statement would not have had the impact that that structure has. And the need to do that, the need to put in the structure actually uh, strengthens the whole concept, you know, bringing in the drizzle, bringing in the silence, contraposing the silence and the busy road, uh, and the, you know, bringing in a word like roars, uh, I thought was ab absolutely brilliant, actually. You know, what is remarkable is that normally when you impose frameworks with, you know, structural rigidity, then people try to fit that in and lose the soul. But the emotional weight in each of these is so remarkable in spite of that structure. Like in her case also, having begun with the thought, to bring it down to that structure, the tendency for most people to not some which, you know, which will meet the structure, but may lose the original emotion you started with. But that has not happened, not only in hers, but in, even in every one of your poems. The, the emotional weight is fantastic. And it almost is... seems as if you have to be inspired first and then find the 
yeah. the words for it. I think it's a, it, it's almost like a prayer descends into you. It's yeah. a bit like the same. You know, it's you can't begin no with saying, I'm hunting for an idea and let yeah. me try and fit it into the 575. We were doing it. It's not a very, uh, you know, ma mathematical, uh, you know, engineering principle. It's a very, it's very inspirational stuff. So if it comes into you, it happens. If it doesn't come into you, you'll be hunting for it for the better part of your life and nothing will happen. I think that's the way I, I, I see it, uh, Doc. I think so. I agree with you. So the the rhythm in the poem is from the idea rather than actually trying to rhyme it, right? So you don't need to... There's no rhyme so, at all. There's no... You need to rhyme it at so all. it's just the, yeah. the whole idea. Yeah. So shall we move on to any other comments or shall we move on to our gin, gin <laughs> session? Gin and I've got the floor for the quite some time actually so we can if anybody has anything any stories to share after that we can uh, do that too yeah okay so i'll share my screen and start off Are you seeing my slide? Not yet. No, no not yet. Uh, why is that? Okay. That came and went. Something about Zoom. We saw that on the screen. Ah, I don't know why it's. Um, why is this screen coming? Uh, so, uh, is this what is uh, what? This is the WhatsApp screen. So, is this what you show? Some pictures and all are showing. Ah, okay. Yeah. All right. Ah, it's come. A little bit. It's got cut in the right. There's yeah. gap on the left. Yeah. So little, okay. Uh, that's fine. That's fine. Okay, so you can see the whole thing, right? Yes, yes. Okay, so this is what I've titled my, I'll tell you what this genesance is later. But uh, so Bernard Mandeville in 1714 writes uh, uh, what I'm going to quote now, a fiery lake that sets the brain in flame, burns up the entrails and scorches every part within. And at the same time, a leth of oblivion in which the wretch immersed drowns his most pinching cares. And this, although it's, uh, he's talking about gin, if you, or any other drink probably, <laughs> I don't know if it's specifically gin, but in those times, gin was the big thing. So he's talking about gin and how uh, it kind of damages you from within while at the same time giving relief to persons who are down and depressed. Okay. So, but over, I mean, in the last century, it was always thought that gin is for squares or gin is for women. It's a women's drink and, you know, it's kind of looked down upon. It even sounds drab. I mean, just gin. When you order a gin, you say, give me a gin. So, I mean, what's the big deal? Unlike, say, if you're ordering a fancy whiskey, you get to say Bruikladish and Kregelachi, or even something as uh, weird as a smoky goat or monkey shoulder, <laughs> something like that, you know? It, it sounds so drab and it's like, it's like some old man's drink. But of course, uh, gin also had uh, its, uh, you know, uh, appreciators amongst the guys. And then it would often be a dry martini. And even the even when you had these kind of different drinks, uh, the num choices of drinks of gins that were available 
in the last century was rather limited. So you had Tancre, Beefeater, Bombay Sapphire, Gordons, and those kind of few things. And typically, a dry martini would cons consist of one of these uh, gins along with vermouth, which I've shown on the left, which is a kind of uh, fortified wine which came from uh, Italy, Turin in Italy. And uh, what they used to say is that if the it inversely proportional to the amount of vermouth was the degree of dryness. So the drier you wanted, the less vermouth you put into it. In fact, uh, Noel Coward has even said that a perfect martini should be made by filling glass with gin and then waving it in the general direction of Italy. So that's, <laughs> that's how extreme you can be when you want a dry martini. And uh, so that's, that's how the older, older generation would consider or look at uh, gin. And this is something you've probably, at least most of you all who, have, uh, who are familiar with uh, Bond are uh, probably aware of this shaken and not stirred. So this in fact was first uh, said in Casino Royale in the book by Ian Fleming. In fact, Fleming put his, uh, his likes of drinks into bo as Bond's likes. So this is actually a drink which uh, Fleming himself liked. And uh, the first time uh, this drink appears, dry martini, which is shaken, not stirred, appears is in Casino Royale, where after meeting his CIA contact, Felix Leiter, for the first time, Bond orders a drink from a barman while at the casino. And he says, a dry martini, one, in a deep champagne goblet. So the waiter says, oui, monsieur. And then he goes on to explain, just a moment, should be three measures of Gordon's, one of vodka, half a measure of Kina Lilit. This is again, one of those wine fortified wines. Shake it very well until it's ice cold and then add a large thin slice of lemon peel. Got it? So that's where he gives the full description of this thing. And later on, uh, this has been used several times. And so the, this is called a vodka martini. But uh, there are people who have analyzed all these Bond stories and found that he's used uh, the vodka martini 19 times, whereas he's used a dry, dry martini 16 times. In fact, there's even a YouTube, a guy who's made a YouTube click, clip of all the times he's use this in the movies. So since we have time, I think I'll share this thing with you. I was going to show you only a clip of it, but... Uh, one, like you said, sir, a not stir. No, that's all. Very well, sir. A medium dry martini, lemon peel, so shake and not stir. Vodka? Of course. So we'll... Huh. So we'll go back to this. Uh, so essentially what this is showing is that in the initial movie, uh, Bond actually never says this. So in the first scene, for example, it's the waiter who comes up describing all this as if Bond has ordered it and he's not bringing it. And in the second step, it's Dr. No, when he is giving him the drink, he describes it. So. Uh, anyway, in many movies, this has gone on and uh, shaken, not stirred is now like an iconic statement, which is among one of the top hundred uh, statements which are recognized among movies. So gin and tonic. So this, of course, is the quintessentially British drink, which has come down through the ages right from the British East India Company days when it was first uh, originated. Uh, in India, most likely, because in those days, and the reason for it is also pretty interesting. In those days, uh, because the entire, you know, all the cantonments across India were malaria infested, uh, one Dr. Cleghorn around 1700 or so suggested that found that quinine, if taken in high enough doses, could prevent uh, malaria. And so everybody, all British officials, soldiers, officers were supposed to have a daily shot of uh, quinine. 
unfortunately quinine is extremely bitter and not very easy to take so people tried all kinds of things to uh, make it taste better and e a little more palatable and around uh, that time schweppes first started selling carbonated water and uh, initially when he sold it it was just uh, carbonated water without anything else but then in india he decided to add the quinine into this and that's how it became indian tonic water tonic of course meaning the quinine tonic uh, which was then the became the kind of standard so you add uh, gin into tonic water with a dash of lime and there voila you have a cold gnt which of course was a perfect solution for a hot afternoon in the indian summer and when all these soldiers and officials went back to england they continued this tradition of having a cold gnt the youngsters however wanted nothing to wanted to have nothing to do with this drink which they thought was something for the old raj fadi daddies and the youngsters uh, moved on to other drinks but the gin and tonic continued to hold its sway among a particular particular generation but then suddenly with the turn of the millennium gin sort of literally burst forth across the world with new gins mushrooming all over the world at a freakish rate and this has been termed the ginessance and the very fact that even the queen of england is launching her own version of a favorite uh, gin which she makes out of ingredients from her back garden suggests how popular this has become in fact she supposedly has a gin every day before lunch i'm not sure how true that is but anyway that's the story and uh, all these gins which have been mushrooming all over the world have used local botanicals so the natural ingredients which are used to flavor the gin have started uh, you know changing from what was traditional to what is locally available across the world and in fact one of the gins monkey 47 is a, is a uber gin from black forest germany has 47 uh, botanicals although i don't know how anybody can ever figure out even the slightest difference between uh, amongst 47 different flavors or uh, even fragrances so maybe a beagle could coming to the indian gins this is something which has also been dramatically getting transformed so uh, the gin consumption is in india is also steadily rising and along with that people have realized that just like craft beer you can have craft gins and uh, small stills are coming up all over the country and making these kind of uh, excellent gins for example this jaisalmer gin is something which uses jaisalmer uh, uh, you know things which are found around jaisalmer it's a kind of uh, himalayan gin and uh, this interesting one is called the peri road peru gin so here what's done is they have flavored it with the masala chaat which you put on uh, perus in the bombay streets and uh, that's that's the flavor they've given to the gin hapusa is even more interesting in that they have tried to mix uh, the flavors of turmeric and mango into this uh, gin so like that there are a lot of uh, these local flavors have sort of pushed their way through for example uh, uh, pumori gin has a very strong cardamom flavor so it's almost probably like having a masala chai of gin so it's that kind of thing so you're like pushing different flavors subtly or more stronger depending on what you like so that's uh, indian gins so what exactly is a gin so the word gin itself is derived from uh, geneva which is dutch for juniper which is one of the botanicals which is one of the key botanicals which are used in the manufacture of gin so originally gin, juniper was thought to be curative especially against plague and that's why they used to add it to the alcohol to try and uh, you know say that this is good for your health gin is good for health kind of thing If you look at the many of these gin bottles you'll see this word London dry gin. So 
this doesn't actually mean that it's from london or that was made in london or anything like that but london actually denotes a method of making gin so in fact in the there are special rules about this and accord and the uh, european parliament has defined this very precisely so london gin to be uh, called london gin it has to be obtained exclusively from ethyl alcohol of agricultural origin with a maximum methanol content of 5 grams per hectoliter of 100% volume alcohol whose flavor is introduced exclusively through the redistillation in traditional stills of ethyl alcohol in the presence of all the natural plant materials used so essentially you dump all the natural materials the botanicals into alcohol and then you distill it that's how you make gin so there are several books about the history of gin and uh, before the current craze the first gin craze was way back in 1720s 1700s 1720 to 1751 and uh, this book called the uh, uh, craze gin and debauchery in the age of reason by jessica warner uh, describes all these interesting stories about that time and the reason it actually started became popular becoming popular at that time is because william of orange the dutch ruler who became the english uh, king in 1689 banned trading with france because uh, the dutch were against the french so french brandy thus became off limits in england at that time and then in 1690 parliament passed an act which was which encouraged the distilling of brandy and spirits from corn and that led to a sudden boom where people started making gin everywhere literally every one in five house was a dram shop so that's how extensive it began so in fact in uh, in her book jessica warner writes that uh, when in 1700s uh, when this first began sorry when this uh, craze first began an average adult drank slightly more than a third of gallon of gin per year by 1720 this amount had nearly doubled and by 1729 when the first restricting act started this number had become 1.3 gallons per capita per year of course and by 1743 this had become 2.2 gallons so imagine the amount of gin that was being consumed in england in those days and unfortunately this had this had a problematic side effect in that people especially the working class became completely addicted to this and they would beg borrow steal and even murder for this so things were getting out of hand and so then parliament started passing several acts eight gin acts were passed between 1729 to 1751 trying to control or stop this kind of extensive spread of gin but none of them actually had their desired effect of stopping the craze in fact uh, around that time dickens writes about this great vice uh because he is he is much more a people's person and he understood the people of those days he writes gin drinking is a great vice in england but wretchedness and dirt are greater and until you improve the homes of the poor or persuade a half famished wretch not to seek relief in the temporary oblivion of his own misery with the pittance which divided among his family would furnish a morsel of bread for each gin shops will increase in number and splendor so basically as long as there are poor who are struggling there's going to be a gin shop uh, around this time there's uh, this captain dudley bradstreet brought out this book in which he describes interesting ways in how he navigated all these gin acts trying to find ways and loopholes to overcome this problem so this image of this cat is actually uh from uh, one of the london distilleries distilleries uh and it is actually from the 1700s what this guy brand street did is because according to the gin act the police couldn't actually enter your home to stop you making uh selling gin as long as it was closed so what he did is he put this picture of this cat in front of his house and he and you see this little pipe sticking out under the paw 
he connected this pipe to a funnel inside his house and when somebody came and whispered into this give me two gins he would pour the gin down the funnel after collecting the money in a little uh, pocket down 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 there and once he heard the clink of the coin he would pour the gin down this tube and that's how uh, he overcame the law that uh, you can uh, over, overcame the law and managed to sell gin so that's how the cat sold gin in england in those days nowadays of course equipment is much more fancy and what you see here could very well be some kind of a scientific experiment but is actually a gin still so you have this huge copper flask here into which the ethyl alcohol is poured along with all the natural botanicals and then the whole thing is heated up and the distillate goes up through these coils through tubes over here and the sediment is collected and repeated distillation can uh, generate different types of gins and different flavors can be added and things like that and so you get various kinds of gin so this is a very fine delicate process which needs to be honed perfectly to get the perfect gin but this is on a larger scale this can be done on a smaller scale also or right on your table you can make your own little gin with your own little natural botanicals and drink it up as you make it so gin stills interestingly are usually called after females after so this had beryl then there's one called bessie so like that those kind of girl names are usually given this little one is called tyler so yeah that's my story about gin and since i had time i went on so thank you but i'll come to an end now all over guys thank you hey uh, you know uh, shibu tell me i must tell you something so interesting that you talked about the monkey 47 now monkey 47 i think was somewhere in the second world war there was some guy who was in berlin who started it off but interestingly there was uh, a person with whom i worked and i was sitting on a board uh, by the name of guring her name was dorothy guring stein and uh, this lady had married dr stein who was the largest importer of scotch whisky into uh, germany and his son alex stein was the one who brought back monkey 47 okay. in fact in my house i got my unopened bottle of monkey 47 oh wow given by him in uh. 2012 or 2013 but now monkey 47 has become so popular ha huh? <laughs> so you know next time you come we'll open it i think you should have <laughs> yeah 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 now i need, really need to taste it <laughs> you must let's taste it before it probably evaporates out i don't know So monkey boy yeah, yeah. Alex Stein and Alex Stein lives in Stuttgart but basically works out of England. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Prasad, yeah. Yeah, Shibu uh, in the early 70s or mid 70s as we were growing out of college and starting to drink uh, gin was obviously a very favorite drink uh, but this little episode in the days when WhatsApp did not exist but the fake messages continued to exist so there were fake rumors <laughs> which used to say that young men became imported if they drank gin. I don't know how many of you heard it. So I know a lot of my friends who just yeah, who went off gin, no? <laughs> yeah, who went off gin because of this uh, fake message. It must have been released by one of these rum guys, you know, <laughs> <laughs> or the whiskey manufacturers. <laughs> and and another interesting episode is because these white spirit and people who don't drink it with tonic, making it pink gin or put a lime and just drink it with water. So I had a friend who narrated an accident that happened to him because. he was on his fourth gin gin with water he was on his fourth or fifth drink and on his sixth drink instead of pouring water he poured more gin so he had one full <laughs> glass of gin which he consumed and he was sloshed for the next 36 hours <laughs> but then you know shibu now uh, if you ever pass by birmingham airport yeah oh beautiful by, you got the gins are amazing You'll never in, see that even in uh, Heathrow. Yeah, the yeah. The kind of collections you have in Birmingham Airport. In fact, I, I I kind of got introduced to gin when we went to Spain and Krishna. When he went out, he found these all these fantastic gins, all kinds of things. You know, we were here sticking around with all these uh, smaller um, sapphire and this and that and all that. Yeah. And there, it was like an amazing collection. Really outstanding. Absolutely. 
any other stories about this so, you know jin uh, was as you were saying you know is considered a really bad thing and you have this famous cartoonist hogarth in those days who has these pictures i've just sent it on the group of uh, what is called jin lane which is you know full of uh, very uh, pe- people really in ruin in fact the other name for it so jay will remember is called blue ruin the cheapest kind of jin is called blue ruin and it tells you how it ruins families but juxtaposed against it is the british drink beer so beer lane was very uh, you know beer street was considered very healthy while uh, gin lane is brings you to ruin and disaster so <laughs> you you had yeah, political yeah. Uh, messages even then <laughs> yeah yeah okay i can Don't round off how do you manage to get all this yeah tum kuch ka doctor ka kaam karte ho kya i think i you one last joke for the evening pulmonologist is doing something with the lungs and all that and you fellow constantly a gin me what about something you are there <laughs> I cannot believe. Uh, sorry. Can be doing haiku poetry with. <laughs> okay. Uh, one last uh, humorous anecdote uh, on beer. Since you mentioned beer, on Indian beer, and this story comes from Professor John Dearden, who is a very well-renowned uh, professor of finance, who was involved in the early days at the IIM Ahmedabad when they were setting up IIM, along with Dr. Uh, professor Morte. and both of them got into some discussion about the quality of indian beer and dearden was boasting about european beer and see i don't think indian beer is good and so they decided that let's send it for testing and just to keep it uh, sort of uh, hidden they poured it out in a little bit like your samples that we give uh, in the hospital and it was sent for testing and uh, professor jerden came to to address all of us and he told us his episode himself he said finally the day the report came dr mote read it out and it said dear dr mote we are happy to tell you that your cow is pregnant <laughs> <laughs> so he said so much for the quality of indian beer <laughs> anyway. okay so anybody else wants to share something otherwise we'll close today's session suresh can say something about hindustani virginia no no that? that was a that was a, <laughs> a ram company ha yeah? <laughs> okay all right guys okay thanks thank you thank you, thank you. Thank you. Good, night. Good, night. good night we are lovely haiku Bye. thank you very much very nice. thank you shubhu that was Bye. fascinating on jin yeah i hope every time we can accompany it by a little tot <laughs> <laughs> yeah we should okay good night bye good night bye